twin turbo V8, rear wheel drive, all aluminum body frame, insane proportions. Yes, Toyota, this is what the people want. The new GR GT looks cool as heck, and while Toyota hasn't revealed too many details about the car, I have an engineering degree, allegedly, and Toyota has released a bunch of pictures, so let's see what we can figure out. Now, Toyota claims this road legal race car has had an unrelenting focus on three key elements. First, a low center of gravity, second, low weight with high rigidity, and third, aerodynamic performance. So we'll look over these, but also estimate the zero to 60 time and talk through the engine and transaxle details. So let's start with that first key element, a low center of gravity. And here's one of the things I think people would be most surprised about this vehicle, just how low of a car it is. It is in fact over three inches shorter than a Honda S2000, and it's close to two inches shorter in height than the new Mazda Miata. But what is its center of gravity? Can we figure this out? Well, Toyota released an image with the center of gravity shown on it. Though, to be fair, we don't know if the CG placement is entirely accurate. But we do know Toyota claims the car will have a 45-55 front rear weight distribution. So if we look at the distance from the center line of each wheel to the center of gravity, we can actually calculate the weight distribution of the vehicle in the image, which turns out to be... 45-55 exactly as Toyota states. So this leads me to believe the CG placement in this image is in fact accurate. If so, and because we know the vehicle's height, we can measure the distance from the ground to the CG versus from the ground to the top of the vehicle, and this gives us a center of gravity height of about 518 millimeters. Now you'll notice this is actually a higher center of gravity than both the GR86 and the GR Supra which are both taller vehicles. So why might this be a higher center of gravity height? Well, I think there are some logical reasons why this could be accurate. First of all, starting off with the GR86, this of course has a boxer engine, right? So a very low, very flat engine. The GR GT has a 90 degree V8, so the CG of this engine is much higher. It also has a hot V setup, so you've got the heavy turbos and exhaust components mounted high on the engine. Now, the Supra has an inline line six, which is a high CG engine, and it's a taller vehicle. So what gives? Well, I think the big hint sits above the rear tires in this image. That is almost certainly the vehicle's high voltage battery pack for the integrated electric motor within the rear transaxle. Clearly, there wasn't any space to mount this down low. So as it sits, it's well above the vehicle's center of mass height. And as a big heavy battery, that's surely raising the CG. That seems to be the clearest reason why this may have a higher CG than the Supra if the CG location shown is accurate. But they still have gone through extensive measures to keep the CG as low as possible. First of all, the entire powertrain is mounted extremely low. You can see just how close it is to the front subframe. There's a few things that make this possible. For the engine, they're using a shorter stroke than you might typically see in a Toyota engine. So this lowers the deck height, which brings down the top of the engine. It also has a dry sump oil system, which have thinner oil pans. So that further allows the engine to drop down, helping to enable the crazy low hood line for the front of the car. The car also makes use of lightweight materials, especially at high points on the vehicle. So you can see carbon fiber used for the hood, for the roof, and for the rear bulkhead, as well as aluminum body panels. All right, but something kind of fun. If we know the vehicle's center of gravity height, we can actually estimate its zero to 60 time because the three key variables we need to know in order to estimate that zero to 60 time are the weight distribution of the car, which Toyota provides us, the center of gravity height, which we have calculated, and the tire's grip, which there is plenty of data out there on. So we can use these assumptions and calculate that zero to 60, assuming the vehicle is traction limited but this is a supercar it's got a lot of power let's assume for that 0 to 60 it is traction limited so here's our equation to calculate in G's the maximum acceleration you could have for a rear wheel drive vehicle with the given variables if we assume our friction coefficient for our tires is 1.3 we could accelerate at 0.95 G's with a 0 to 60 of 2.9 seconds now if we don't have quite that much grip from our tires let's say 1.2 well that gives us an acceleration of 0.86 G's and a 0 to 60 of about 3.2 seconds. 
By the way, this is not including any rollout nonsense, right? So the big car magazines would delete about 0.2 seconds from each of those times. And something that's interesting to note is that having that higher center of gravity versus like the 86 and the Supra actually improves the zero to 60 time because it means you have more weight transfer to that rear tire, which is putting down the power. So just as an example, if it were to have the same center of gravity height as the GR86 and we have that same grip of 1.3, well, then we are going to get a zero to 60 time of about 3.0 seconds. So a tenth of a second just from a small difference in where that center of gravity is. So that's kind of neat. Now, truthfully, my best guess, where is the zero to 60 of this thing gonna fall? Probably in the low to mid threes because it is fairly heavy and it doesn't have an extraordinary amount of power. So I think realistically, we're looking at low to mid threes. Now, there will likely be higher performance versions of this released over time, right? So I wouldn't be surprised to see that happen. And if so, have that zero to 60 time dip into the high twos. Regardless, it's not going to have the crazy zero to 60 times of something like the Corvette ZR1, even though the the GRGT has an excellent weight distribution for a rear wheel drive vehicle because when the engine goes behind the driver, like in the ZR1, it just enables so much more grip for a rear wheel drive launch. And as always, it often comes down to the tires as they make a huge difference in what the potential performance numbers will be, as I've personally experienced on my own GR, the rad little GR Corolla. Of course, not all cars are performance cars. Sometimes practicality is the top priority. And with practical cars, the tire selection should match the job. In this portion of the video, sponsored by Continental, I'm going to be talking about their Cross Contact LX25 tire, which I've ran on my Maverick for two years as my summer tires, versus their True Contact Tour 54 tire. Both of these tires are all season touring tires. What does that mean? Well, what's prioritized in the design of these tires is that they're quiet, comfortable, and long lasting with deep treads. In fact, these are among Continental's longest lasting tires they sell today, with up to 70,000 and 80,000 mile warranties respectively. They're both EV compatible, offer great wet grip, have tread indicators so you know when the tire is still good for dry, wet, and snow, as well as alignment indicators. While both of these touring tires are similar, the Tour 54 is geared more towards sedans and crossovers, while the LX25 is designed for crossovers and SUVs. I only have about 8,000 miles on my truck, but the vast majority of those miles have been on these tires, and they've been great. Now, Toyota's second key element is that the vehicle would have a low weight and high rigidity, but I wouldn't necessarily say this is a lightweight vehicle. Toyota claims the weight will be 1750 kilograms or lower. And so if you look at a competitive set, this really isn't that impressive of a number. So this is probably the biggest downside with this vehicle is the weight. Looking at the Lexus LFA, of course, this was not a hybrid vehicle, so it has that advantage, but it did have a larger engine and that vehicle was about 600 pounds lighter than the Toyota GR GT. If you look at the McLaren 720S, significantly lighter vehicle, though, you know, same size engine, twin turbo V8, four liter, doesn't have a hybrid system, probably more expensive, so perhaps not the best comparison. But here's one, Porsche Turbo S. This is a vehicle that weighs very similarly 25 kilograms less than the GR GT, though it has more power, it has a powerful hybrid system, and it has all wheel drive. So all of that and still coming in under the weight of Toyota's claim for the GR GT. Aston Martin Vantage S, probably the closest comparison we could get in terms of weight and performance performance, very similar in power, a little bit more power for the Vantage S and just slightly lighter using that same style four liter twin turbo V8, though it does not use a hybrid system, but you know, Aston Martin, right? It's got a luxury element to it. So that is always caring less about weight than, you know, cars that are going for all out performance. So GRGT weighing similarly to the Vantage S, I feel like is kind of showing, hey, this isn't that light of a vehicle. Now, one example out there, the AMG GT 63 SEP QRS, TUV uh, also has a four liter twin turbo V8, way heavier than the GRGT, but way more power, way more torque. It does have a powerful hybrid system and it's also all wheel drive versus rear wheel drive like the GRGT. So realistically, the thing is kind of heavy. But that's not to say that Toyota hasn't gone to lengths to remove weight from this car. Toyota says this is the first time they've used an all aluminum body frame. Of course, we mentioned the carbon fiber used with the body panels. 
They're also using Brembo carbon ceramic brakes. They've used carbon fiber for the torque tube going through the transmission tunnel. And leading into Toyota's third key element, there are no active aerodynamic elements. Everything is passive, which helps with weight and removes complexity. Now, speaking of aerodynamics, Toyota says that it took an aerodynamics first approach with this vehicle, and aerodynamic performance is the third key element for this car. Though it seems this is likely referring to aerodynamic efficiency, as it certainly doesn't look, at least, like a high downforce car. But they are targeting low drag, so it can reach speeds in excess of 320 kilometers per hour, or about 200 miles per hour. The aerodynamic element elements do all appear to be functional, with outlets for the turbulent tire air, various cooling ducts, and a hood scoop for cooling the top-mounted hot V turbochargers. Now speaking of turbos, let's chat about this engine. So we've got a 4-liter twin-turbo 90-degree V8. Toyota says it's going to make 641 horsepower or greater with 627 pound-feet of torque or greater. It's going to have port and direct injection. This is great. I love this. There's a lot of benefits to doing this. I have a whole video explaining what they all are, but another cool benefit is that it keeps your intake valves clean. You don't have to worry so much about carbon deposits building up on them. This engine also has a short stroke and a wide bore, so let's kind of look through some other Toyota engines out there and compare it, starting with the Lexus LFA. 88 millimeter bore with a 79 short stroke, which allowed it to rev up to that 9,000 RPM. Now looking at the GR Corolla, very similar in bore, but a longer stroke, significantly longer stroke here, doesn't rev quite as high, 7,200 RPM. The GR GT matches the bore of the GR Corolla, but uses a significantly shorter stroke. So looking at that, you could kind of say, hey look, it looks a little bit like it's a bit of an eight cylinder GR Corolla engine, it does not appear to be related to their new 2 liter turbo 4, which could possibly be making up to 400 horsepower out of a little 2 liter, their G20e engine, which appears to have a much longer stroke and a narrower bore. So looking at the GRGT, one of the things I thought might be interesting is if we look at their piston speeds and the RPM that their other engines are able to reach, could we calculate perhaps where the red line is going to be for this GRGT? So if you were to assume it has a similar average piston speed as the GR Corolla engine, you could expect to see a red line of about 7,800 RPM, which because it's turbocharged, I think it's probably going to be closer to this than the naturally aspirated LFA. But if it were to have piston speed similar to the Lexus LFA, well, then that would put it somewhere at about 8,500 RPM. Now, I think realistically, somewhere around 8,000 would be feasible. Now, that said, if it actually is revving to 8,000 RPM and it's only making 641 horsepower, well, then it's not going to be using that much boost. So, I do think it is possible that this engine could rev fairly high, and I do think we're going to see higher performance variants where we actually crank up this horsepower number because it's going to have the capability. Another cool thing looking at the transaxle is how it enables enables a shorter wheelbase. So, of course, the power comes from the engine and travels to the back of the car, connected by a wet clutch passing through the electric motor, which can also supplement power and help reduce any perceived turbo lag, as well as maintain positive torque during shifts from Toyota's newly developed 8-speed automatic transmission. And then the power reaches the back of the transaxle and a pair of gears reverses the power direction, sending that power back towards the mechanical limited slip differential, which splits power between both wheels. These conical gears reversing the direction of the power and sending it towards the front is essentially what you'd see used in an all-wheel drive vehicle to send power to the front axle. Here, it enables pushing the transaxle towards the back of the car, keeping weight on the rear axle, improving power delivery, while pushing the rear wheels forward, enabling a shorter wheelbase and keeping the overall length of the vehicle shorter. So a cool packaging solution. And just a final comment, Toyota really does seem to have done a good job keeping this car simple in a world where cars are becoming increasingly complex. It's using your typical coil springs for the suspension. There aren't any active aerodynamics elements, straightforward overhead cam setup for the valve train using chain drives, nothing crazy going on with the turbos, and sure, you have the hybrid system, but Toyota has been cranking out dependable hybrid powertrains for decades, so overall, it looks like this should have classic Toyota reliability, which isn't always the case in the world of supercars. Hopefully sometime I can get behind the wheel and tell you if it drives as good as it looks. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below. Thanks for watching.